deduct the commercial's longs from the shorts, you're left over with a balance uh, that's net short. And the specs are, are uh, ne almost always net long. And when these uh, positions explode to a maximum, uh, it means we're coming up near a peak usually. And the commercials are almost always uh, on the correct side of the bet. They uh, go the most short, right near a peak. And then as uh, gold and silver fall, they start to cover the, their shorts. Uh, now, we had uh, the greatest short position in history recently. Hmm. And I'm, I'm looking for a chart here, but I don't see it in front of me. So uh, I won't bother with that. But uh, the, the, there were many uh, analysts that got very bullish on gold and silver over the past several months. And I made some small purchases for myself. You know, I've got a precious metals dealership, but that's very separate from my own personal investing. And my own personal investing has been in uh, physical gold and silver bullion for quite a while now. I used to have a lot of mining stocks. I sold those uh, back in uh, 2008 or 2010. I can't remember exactly uh, when. But uh, um, uh, I've been uh, strictly bullion for quite a while because I did a study on uh, the difference between uh, bullion and the stocks. And if you take the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which goes back uh, a long ways, but you take it since gold became free trading in 1971, and gold has outperformed the mining stocks that are in the Barron's Gold Mining Index by 400% since then. So the mining stocks tend to uh, give you leverage on the way up, but they have a little bit more leverage on the way down. And uh, over time, that increases the losses. So I just went with uh, bullion. But anyway, I was expecting it. I don't. I know that somebody dumped a, a, a quite a few tons of gold onto the market um, when the price collapsed uh, that day. And uh, but. You know, after just after the market had closed, I made a significant. I have a. I do a monthly accumulation myself. I uh, accumulate some gold and silver every single month. Uh, that's called dollar cost averaging, and it's one of the best ways uh, to. You know, when the price drops, you get more for your uh, currency, and <clears throat> I like it when the price drops. A lot of people uh, hate this. They don't. They point at it and they say, oh, this is a manipulation and stuff. Well, yes, gold and silver are manipulated. And, and that's the only reason that you get the opportunity to buy gold and silver cheap, much, much cheaper than what market prices would normally dictate. Uh, if uh, gold and silver uh, were uh, in the correct equilibrium where supply and demand is being set into equilibrium by price, it's called the price discovery mechanism. If that wasn't being manipulated, there would be no opportunity. Uh, gold would already be a few thousand bucks an ounce and, uh, or, and, and greater, and uh, that would make it profitable for the mining companies. Right now, the mining companies are all having a very tough time, and that's a good sign. That means that there's going to be shortages in the future, and that means that it's going to go higher. Without the manipulation, it would never have the, uh, you wouldn't have the opportunity of gold and silver one day exploding to the upside and they are going to do that one day uh, and I have pretty much bet everything on it. Uh, so I really like these pullbacks. I hope it goes lower and guess what the commitment of traders reports they didn't cover that much of their short position last week. So that, that means that there is a lot more room for it to go lower than uh, it is right now. So when I made my purchase on the uh, day that uh, gold and silver took that the first big drop I <clears throat> only spent I, I had a certain amount of cash in reserve and I only spent about half of it um, and I'm withholding some more for another buying opportunity I still will be doing my monthly accumulation on top of that but every once in a while uh, I make a much larger than normal purchase so I was actually expecting this. Uh, if you, I did a video on it, I believe last week, uh, where I played some of my insiders' reports uh, from uh, August 16th, I think it was when I when one when I drew some charts and I said if it falls to this area right here, 
I'm going to make a purchase. And that, it hit that target, and I made my purchase. You know, it's funny. Uh, you mentioned how the price of gold continually drops, and many people say, well, maybe it's a good time to sell. In America, our mindset is a little uh, confused. I mean, if something goes on sale in a store, <laughs> we run out and we purchase it. If And then we see the price dropping. If the price drops, you know, if we see gold or silver, the price drop, our minds immediately say we must sell this. And it's a very strange thing where we're a little confused on what we should do with these type of um, investments. And yeah. it's, it's a very odd thing. And, and it's very tough to convince people, you know, no, this is a very good opportunity right now where you should be purchasing a lot more of it because it's, to me, it's on sale. And I don't think we'll get this chance, you know, anytime soon. It might go a little bit lower, but I mean, right now it's on sale. Absolutely. And this is the typical public mindset, and it's completely opposite of the way they run the uh, rest of their lives. They and, and it's being ruled by your own fear and greed. Uh, and it's uh, something that you have to battle. But, you know, uh, I... Uh, started studying the with the crash of the Nasdaq in 2000. I really started studying the markets and the global economy and monetary history. And by uh, 2002, I uh, made up my mind that uh, precious metals was the place to be. I started purchasing gold. I've got a tube of gold eagles that uh, only cost me $325 each. <laughs> wow! <laughs> October of of 2002. By April of 2003, I, I had discovered silver, and I started buying a whole bunch of mining stocks, and I caught the very last up leg uh, where uh, the mining stocks actually outperformed. If you uh, create a chart that is um, the uh, HUI index or the XAU index, the Philadelphia Gold Mining Index or the or Gold Bugs Index and the unhedged uh, gold um, gold and silver mining index, uh, you, and you divide those charts by go the price of gold, you can find out uh, uh, how many ounces of gold it's worth. And if the chart is going up, that means stocks are out, the mining stocks are outperforming the physical metals. If they're falling, uh, the physical metals are outperforming the mining stocks. And, uh, you know, it, it was falling from uh, uh, 2006 until... Uh, just last December, and then turned around, and the mining stocks have been outperforming the metals since last December. It was a very good buying opportunity. I'm not really sure uh, if you know if gold and silver continued down for you know I've been expecting a deflationary recession, and uh, so it is possible that we could see lower prices. And the fact that the commitment of traders, the commercials have not completely covered their shorts; they only covered about uh, 15 or 20 percent of their short position. Uh, that says to me that uh, things sh should go a little bit lower than this. But to me, I just consider it a buying opportunity. It's mm -hmm. it's going to be it's on sale. Yeah. This is something to look forward to, not to fear. Uh, and another thing is uh, in in my insider's report, I said this is similar. This the precious metals market and the economy. This is similar to a bow and arrow or a, a slingshot. And the further you pull back on that bow before releasing the arrow, the, the higher and further that arrow is going to fly and the faster it's going to go. And uh, if you want gold to hit, if you're an investor in precious metals and you want gold and silver to hit spectacular highs, then you want this, uh, we're, we're in a cyclical bear market inside of a secular, a giant secular bull market. The bull market will resume one day, but this bear market, you want this grinding bear market to beat people to death and to make them feel like it's, it's an impossible situation and uh, you want the maximum number of people to give up on this sector and then it is ready for a spectacular charge. If this market had just kept on marching ahead like it had from the year 2001 to 2011, um, it you know, too many get rich quick people and the dumb money jumps on board mm. and it w it wouldn't go nearly as high uh you know the we would probably the bull market probably would be over by now if it had just kept on marching along for the uh the next five years and we were up at twenty two hundred dollars but i'm expecting 
price is well north of five thousand dollars an ounce uh, it's all because gold and silver are the only investment out there that has a central bank guarantee the central banks will add they they have absolutely guaranteed all of us uh, purely by the design of a debt-based fiat currency monetary system that they will always print more and more and more currency they will never stop the currency supplies always have to expand infinitely uh, into the future <clears throat> gold and silver are finite and they are the other thing that is considered money there they are the other safe haven investment uh, most investor, investors are taught to go toward high quality debt like U.S. Treasury bonds, but there will come a day when uh, sovereign debt becomes uh, very suspect. And at that point in time, uh, everybody is going to be rushing toward gold and silver. And, and that is when, the, the, when everything goes nuclear, when you see gold and silver become unaffordium and unobtainium. Let's move on to the economy. Uh, the Fed, the uh, U.S. government, the corporate media, they are continually telling the American public that the economy is recovered. I mean, they, they just put out the job numbers. Um, they're telling us that everything is fine. I, they inched up a little bit, but they still tell us that everything is fine. And when you look at the real economic indicators, and when I say the real economic indicators, I'm not talking about manipulated unemployment or manipulated GDP. When we look at like retail and we look at housing, yeah. we look at, you know, everything, um, corporate defaults and, uh, manufacturing, we see all that declining from your viewpoint. Uh, is this an economy that is robust and improving or do you see the opposite happening? One of the things that I love to do is to sort of haunt the Fed, the Federal Reserve's website. The St. Louis Fed has something called the St. Louis Fred, F-R-E-D. <laughs> which is their research and educational uh, site. And you can generate thousands and thousands of, uh, you can generate charts from different, thousands of different data sets. And they collect information on everything. And you get, uh, they also import the information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau and every other department of the government that generates statistics. And so it's all there in one place. And you can, take these charts and you can uh, put them in different formats where it's uh, year over year percent change or whatever. Uh, you can pick uh, different time periods. And one of the things that I've been showing in several of my, the last few months, I've been showing a lot of videos uh, showing that, you know, this, first of all, this is the weakest recession on record. It took zero interest rates and the creation of $3.2 trillion worth of base currency and they bought the uh, the weakest recovery on record. And when you look at how things are starting to go negative on many of these indicators, you mentioned many of them, but you can also include things like uh, the year-over-year um, -year change in government income, the uh, number of rail miles. This is a very good measurement of the health of the economy. How much stuff is being shipped all over the country? You know, so the number of rail miles is a very important indicator, and it's been falling. And uh, a whole bunch of these uh, uh, data sets are showing that uh, we entered a recession uh, either last quarter or the, uh, you know, when they declare a recession, uh, it's a trailing indicator. You have to have two consecutive quarters of bad economic news for them to declare that we're in a recession, which means the recession started more than six months ago. Uh, and so if you go to the Fed's website, you can get a glimpse into the future. And I believe that we're already in a recession. If we aren't, it's probably going to start in the next quarter. But I, I think we've already started a re recession. And I think uh, that, you know, right after the elections, things are going to start getting uh, worse and that we're going to see a crash. And I don't think the uh, Fed is going to be raising interest rates. I think they're going to be dropping interest rates again to zero. And if they have to go negative, they will. And there will be more QE. Uh, that's what will happen when the next recession hits. And here's something that most people don't know is that since the beginning of the United States, there has been a recession roughly every four and a half years. Uh, we are now, you know, the, this recession uh, is from 2009 
And uh, so we're seven years into this economic expansion. It's the third longest economic expansion in history. And it's uh, pretty soon it will become the second longest economic expansion in history, which means that the odds of going into a uh, recession uh, this year or uh, at, at least by next year, uh, the odds of going into a recession before the end of 2017 are probably greater than 90% at this point. I haven't calculated them, but based on history, uh, it, it, it's almost impossible that we will still be seeing economic growth in 2018. So we're right around the corner uh, from this. And when it happens, if people take a look at my episode seven of Hidden Secrets of Money, and they should watch episode six first because it sets you up with a whole lot of information of why this next recession should be deflationary. And then uh, episode seven teaches people about the velocity of currency. Uh, in the long run, the quantity of currency determines prices, but in the short run, it's the psychology, it's the mood of the country that determines whether prices go up or down. And uh, the mood of the country is what determines whether or not you go out to dinner and take your friends out and spend and have a good time and borrow currency and buy a house and buy a new car and a new flat screen TV. And every time you make a, a, transactions, the velocity of currency is how many times a, unit, a single unit of currency, like a dollar, uh, changes hands over a period of time like a year. And uh, the velocity, you know, they created three point, they added 400% more base currency. It took 200 years to go from $0.8 trillion in existence of paper dollars, the base currency. There was only $825 billion before the crash of 2008. And now there's $4 trillion. So they created another $3.2 trillion, 400% more, and put it on top of what we already had. That means they created 800 years worth of currency in just the past uh, six years. And that's going to come back to haunt them. But it didn't cause uh, retail price inflation. It only inflated uh, a few asset classes. It inflated uh, stocks, bonds, and real estate again, back into bubbles. And um, the, it, the reason that it didn't uh, uh, create any retail price inflation, or very little, it's actually more than they say it. It is if you I, I believe that the, you know about John Williams shadow government statistics and mm -hmm. the pre Ronald Reagan CPI I think the truth is actually somewhere in the middle uh, but still inflation is a lot higher than what they're saying it is uh, but uh, with zero interest rates uh, around the world and some negative interest rates this is the market desperately trying to deflate to set uh, everything in balance once again. And the powers that be are all Keynesians, the world's central bankers, the people that run the global economy, uh, believe in Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes, for any listeners that don't know who he was, was an economist during the 20s and 30s that uh, came up with the theory that uh, you should that governments should have an elastic currency supply that can expand when there's an economic downturn and the governments can do a bunch of deficit spending and uh, create jobs to, to try and lift us out of the uh, the downturns, the recessions. But then they're supposed to contract it again after the recession is over, and they've never done that. But um, Negative interest rates are proof that Keynesian economics uh, does not work. But I believe this next recession will be deflationary because what we've seen so far is they created $3.2 trillion, but the velocity of currency fell to almost exactly neutralize the inflationary effect of that $3.2 trillion. So they added 400% to base currency, and it did nothing because uh, most of it is sitting on the bank's balance sheets and it doesn't circulate, it's parked. However, the banks get to uh, use that for fractional reserve lending during the daytime. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, I've been generating a chart on the Fed's website for uh, a few years now, showing every, I update it periodically, showing uh, the uh, Wilshire 5000 total market cap index. So this is the market capitalization of the 5000 largest uh, public companies in the United States. And that means 
that it's basically the value of the stock market. The 5,000 largest companies probably represent 98% of the value mm. of the stock market. And um, when you overlay that with the, uh, with the creation of base currency, there was no correlation before, the, before 2008. But after the crash of 2008, the correlation is almost exact. This recovery was bought and paid for by driving up uh, real estate and driving up the stock market uh, where, where this, this, this excess $3.2 trillion was given to the big banks that have been using this to gamble in the stock market. And the proof is that uh, this, the rise of the stock market almost exactly tracks basement. I mean, the correlation is really scary. So, um, But I do think that this next crash, and we're due for another one, uh, you know, we had the crash of the NASDAQ. It was stocks in the year 2000. Greenspan lowered the rates to 1%, held them there too long to reflate the stock markets. And when you manipulate the free market, you can never predict uh, what's going to come squirting out. Uh, you know, there's always some unintended consequences that come squirting out. And he couldn't even see that he was creating a real estate bubble that, like the world had never seen before. And so the next crash in, in 2008 was stocks and real estate. Well, now we're at the end stages of a 35-year-old uh, bond bull market, uh, and bonds have, are also have been pushed into a bubble. Uh, and uh, so the next crash that, that's coming up is stocks, real estate, and bonds, because real estate is also back in, into a bubble. It's, this one's going to be worse than uh, the previous crashes. You're saying that uh, this crash coming up is going to be a lot worse than what we saw in 2008. Yes, and the, the popping of a bond bubble is very deflationary. The bond bubble did not pop. The bond bubble just marched ahead forward uh, during the last crash. Uh, so yes, this is going to be much more devastating and most likely deflationary. However, all the uh, the world's central banks, you know, they're Keynesians, and they've already shown their cards. Their answer is to print and take interest rates down. Well, they can't take interest rates down too much below zero without uh, going to a cashless society and outlawing uh, paper currency, uh, because people will start if it's costing you one, two, three percent, four percent interest to keep your currency in the bank. You're just going to buy a safe and keep it at home instead, mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, as they go into this deflationary uh, collapse, the only bullet that they've got is to print and print and print until deflation starts to give way. The problem is, if the public is scared, and this time, you know, episode seven of Hidden Secrets of Money shows that, you know, the crash of the NASDAQ, the baby boomers still had 20 years to recover if they lost something. Uh, the crash of two th the global crisis of 2008, in which they saw their eye, you know, their IRAs went down after the crash of the NASDAQ. They recovered back to where they were uh, in 2007, but then with the crash of 2008, their IRAs went down even further than, than they had gone in the crash of the NASDAQ. And now they've recovered. If you inflation adjust it, the stock markets are still 10% down from the year 2000, and that's using the CPI, which I like to call the CP lie. Uh, so the markets are really down even more than 10% when you're comparing them to how much goods and services you can actually buy. Uh, and this next crash is going to be even more devastating, but the baby boomers do not have any time left to recover. So they are not going to go out and borrow and spend after this next crash. When they see their retirement accounts shrink again, they are just going to get very scared and they're just going to to save. They're going to pay down debt and save because they've been punished three times in a row for investing. So those baby boomers um, who are dependent on their pensions, on retirement, what happens to them? Do, will they lose their retirement? Yes, they're going to have to work into their 70s and 80s and uh, they're going to try have to try to, you know, the average IRA uh, or 401k has 10 thousand dollars or less in it uh, that's a month's worth of living that's that can't get anybody by for retirement 
Uh, so the baby boomers, you know, this is a something that has, you know, since we have had central banking and Keynesians have been running the show, if you look at interest rates for the history of the United States, uh, once we had the Federal Reserve, we had ultra low interest rates during the Great Depression. We had interest rates that had never been seen in history uh, during these uh, uh, 70s and the early 80s where you went into the high teens. That's the type of thing that normally uh, the cupper, uh, is accompanied with the beginnings of a hyperinflation. You don't have, uh, you know, Fed funds rate hit, hitting 19 percent. Uh, and after that, we had a 30-year period uh, and a, most, a lot of it under Alan Greenspan where um, we were in a disinflationary era. Every year there was less inflation. Every year interest rates came down. And this encouraged borrowing and spending because you could take uh, a, you could do a refi on your home, refinance it, take cash out, out remodel your kitchen, uh, put on an addition, uh, put in a swimming pool, buy an SUV, or take a vacation with this cash out refinance. And then five years later, interest rates were so much lower and you, the value of your home went up that mm -hmm. you could then do it again and actually lower your payments each time because interest rates had fallen. Uh, and so this trained an entire generation of baby boomers to borrow and spend and a lot of it was Alan Greenspan holding interest rates just slightly below uh, what, what a free market would dictate and uh, that has created an entire generation of reckless borrowers and spenders. And that's the reason they don't have uh, anything in their retirement accounts. They've got basically a month's worth of living expenses. If they get frugal, they might be able to stretch that out to uh, three or four months. But <laughs> that's not a retirement. So what about the uh, generation, the, the, the uh, individuals that are 30, 40, 50 who are still working? Yeah. Um, I mean, I in 2008. Because taxes uh, are only going to go up and they are going to have the burden of carrying all these baby boomers up on their back and it's the largest sector of it's 75 million people uh, that need to ret you know are retiring now and will be retiring for the next decade so will those i mean they have to carry the baby boomers but will there be jobs i mean back in 2008 many corporations laid off many yeah. individuals co companies closed down if this crash happens and it's worse than 2008 you know what are all these people going to do because last time we saw in california and many other places people just walked out of their homes because interest rates started to rise they had a variable rate exactly. of interest so this time around what happens uh well this time around a lot of baby boomers do end up homeless and, and uh uh, this time around, the the younger people that you're talking about, a lot of those jobs do vanish, and uh, it's one of the things that is also happening is government is creating so many laws and so many rules that it's very, very difficult. I left California uh, because uh, it was just an absolute nightmare trying to run a business in California. Uh, it causes many sleepless nights, and it, it whittles away at your health and and uh, it's it's uh, and it's the government's fault. They are destroying prosperity by trying to uh, uh, you know promise everybody everything and, and trying to protect everybody. Uh, right now, uh, if um, any business in California is guilty until proven innocent when it comes to uh, employee claims, uh, when it comes to uh, the government with OSHA or the uh, labor board or uh, taxation uh, and so you can't just ignore something or blow it off they'll just uh, shut you down and take your business away uh, it, it's become uh, very very difficult and that means that there's going to be even less jobs the more they you know in the state of Washington they uh, raise the minimum wage up to 15 bucks an hour and what happens is somebody invents a hamburger flipping machine and mm -hmm. you know a guy dropping french fries into uh, some uh, hot grease uh, and pushing a broom at McDonald's, those jobs are exist so that somebody can uh, get an entry-level job and learn how to show up on time and how to work with other employees and your employer and get some experience. 
they're not meant to give you a living wage. You're supposed to be living in an apartment with, sharing an apartment with three other people, you know, to get by, and you work your way out of that. Those jobs are for the high school dropouts. And uh, what happens when you see people say, oh, well, that's not fair. We have to uh, mandate a minimum wage. Immediately you see youth unemployment go up and you see uh, a minority unemployment skyrocket. So it's a very, di minimum wage is a very discriminatory mean practice. The market sets things into perfect equilibrium. You will have maximum employment uh, if, if you allow the free market to do it. But the government doesn't allow a free market. We have a manipulate. There is no such thing right now as a free market. There is no such thing as capitalism, which is getting, capitalism is getting blamed for all of these problems that are created by cronyism. Uh, a big business that is allowed to lobby government and get special rules put in place for them that don't apply to anybody else. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, we're going through a cycle right now uh, where it, you asked about uh, the younger generations. Uh, it's going to be tough. Unemployment will be high. It'll be hard to get those jobs. Many people wonder, uh, everyone talks about the crash and the collapse or the crisis, whatever word you want to use. How long will this last? I mean, when people say, okay, the whole system's coming down, it might come down this fall, maybe in the spring of 2017 or whenever it does, how long can people expect things to be bad? Well, if, if the world's central bankers were not Keynesians, I would be agreeing with Harry Dent. My guest in episode number six of Hidden Secrets of Money is Harry Dent. Mm -hmm. And we discuss uh, many of the reasons that this next crash is definitely going to be deflationary. And I have been saying this since I wrote my book, which was written from 2005 to 2007. It was just updated recently for 2015. Uh, but uh, everything I wrote in there has been coming true. I, I said that uh, you know, we would have the threat of deflation to which Ben Bernanke would overreact and do a big helicopter drop of currency, which would cause a big in inflation. It didn't cause an inflation of retail prices. It caused a huge inflation of the of asset prices because we're back into bubbles in uh, stocks and real estate and bonds now. Uh, and uh, then we would go in. The next crisis would uh, be real deflation that hits us, contraction of the currency supply. And then the central world's central bankers would overreact. I do not think that uh, the deflation that is coming will last that long. Uh, what will happen is they will print and print and print, and velocity will continue to drop as all of the uh, people that you know they'll they'll try anything to get cash into the hands of the public so that they'll go out and spend. But the scared baby boomers, a quarter of the of the U.S. population, and the largest sector of the workforce, is going to uh, because their their anxiety levels are very high. They're going to save every extra dollar. And when you save dollars, they don't circulate. When they're sitting in a savings account, they're parked. That means velocity falls, and that will continue until they get enough saved to where they feel like they they've got enough for a retirement and they can actually go out and buy the latest cell phone or replace their aging car or get a new flat screen TV. Uh, you know, this will also be accompanied by a whole lot of people trying to downsize. Their kids are now gone, uh, they're off to college or they've got their own families and they don't need a four or five bedroom house anymore. They, you know, have this dream of uh, getting a condo on the golf course. Uh, so uh, you've got a real estate crash accompanied with a whole bunch of uh, people that don't need a McMansion anymore, and it's the largest sector of the population. So uh, I, I think you're going to see something rather spectacular, but the central bankers, the Keynesians that are running the show, by which, by the way, they are wrong. Their theories are wrong. Keynesian economics isn't even remotely plausible. Uh, but they are going to print and print and print and print until deflation gives way, but that will happen after a bunch of currency is saved. And we have some very good examples of this, and I had data uh, from the First World War in Germany, and 
you know, they expanded their currency supply. They added 400% to their currency supply during the war, and there was zero inflation during the war because there was a lot of anxiety. People were didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring. Their sons were being killed. They stashed every extra mark that was printed, and it didn't circulate. And then the anxiety was lifted with the end of the war, and they had a 900% hyperinflation in, a, in, in 14 months. It was a pre-hyperinflation hyperinflation that no economists have ever talked about. It was the not the 1923 hyperinflation that uh, everybody, you know, is, it's known as the Weimar hyperinflation, but I'm talking about the 1919 to 1921, uh, Jan February of 1921, tw 19, yeah, 21, uh, pre-hyperinflation, hyperinflation, where uh, everybody lost 90% uh, uh, of the purchasing power of all that currency that they had saved. Once it came that came out of hiding and you had this increased currency supply plus increased velocity, people started spending. They had put off all their purchases for four years during the war and uh, they they needed goods and so on and, and they were sick of being poor and the anxiety is lifted. They know what the future is going to bring and they started spending and prices uh, went up ninefold. Um, uh, it's in the hidden secrets of money number seven and uh, I encourage people to watch it because this is all based on looking at uh, monetary history and uh, the current economic uh, situation and uh, psychology and demographics and adding all of those things together to try and predict the future and so far everything I read in my book you can, wrote in my book you can sort of check it off like a list these things did happen, and what, what I predicted that, that, has, that did not happen, I believe, has not happened yet. It's on, will. It, it's on its way. Exactly. Yeah. It's coming down the road at us uh, like an 18-wheeler uh, coming out of the fog.